Well, it's, it's great being at the, back at the Kennedy School and at the, at the Carr Center, and I really want to uh, thank Doug and, and particularly Adam Mora for uh, organizing this conference and inviting me to participate in it. Uh, I, wanna, I wanted to talk about the, the impact uh, of, of uh, the policy uh, in favor of torture uh, that was initiated uh, during the last administration and, and its impact on our ability uh, to be a, a global leader for human rights and, and for criminal justice. Uh, the United States has been that leader since the time of Nuremberg. I was just there uh, last weekend for the 70th anniversary of the, of the great uh, judgment uh, against the Nazi leaders. Uh, after the Cold War, we actively supported the establishment of the Yugoslavia Tribunal of Rwanda and Sierra Leone tribunals and courts uh, where I work myself, as, as well as, uh, as tribunals and and, and accountability mechanisms for other countries that uh, had suffered mass atrocities. And our message as a nation in both administrations, uh, the administrations of both parties, since the 1990s has been when, when leaders have committed serious violations of, of human rights, you need to hold them to account. Turn them over to an international court if one has been established or, or develop your own fair process doesn't make any difference if they represent powerful interests or have strong popular support, uh, that we're willing to work with them uh, and, and with others on developing flexible approaches uh, such as our support for uh, the, uh, the special jurisdiction for peace that would have been part of the Colombian peace agreement if it had been adopted this week and which we hope will still be part of a peace agreement in, in Colombia. It also, I think, is, is a good policy, an effective policy, as, as Catherine was has written that countries that take action and demonstrate there's no impunity even for the powerful have lower levels of interpersonal violence thereafter. And I know from my own experience uh, in several places uh, uh, there seems to be less impunity for, for corruption and for other examples of, uh, of official misconduct. As, as, I'm asked, as, uh, as Dean Elmendorf said, uh, it's important, of course, that our country do what's right, uh, but our brand very much uh, is our values. Our values underlie our strength and deepen the support that we receive from peoples around the world. And that values-based foreign policy, I think, is even more important to us in the United States uh, on global issues as uh, we live in an increasingly multipolar world uh, where we're no longer the country with the largest economy. The policy implemented by the, by the Bush administration represented a reversal from that course. These actions, of course, included the, the OLC opinions that authorized enhanced interrogation, public statements that the Geneva Conventions, all of which we've been a leader on, but were quaint, uh, the enactment of the so-called American Service Members Protection Act that mandated non-cooperation, even obstruction uh, to the International Criminal Court Treaty that we had signed and that had been ratified by our European, Asian, and Latin American allies. They described that law as the, as the Hague Invasion Act, because it did, in fact, authorize the president to invade the Hague to spring an American if they, if they fell to the justice of the ICC. These positions began to moderate later in the Bush administration. The OLC opinions as to military detention were withdrawn. The US didn't veto the referral of the situation in Darfur to the ICC by the Security Council. And by, by 2008, the Bush administration had become one of the strongest supporters of ICC prosecutions of the atrocities in, in Darfur, as Prosecutor Marino O'Connell will tell you. In the Obama administration, the OLC opinions as to intelligence agency detentions were withdrawn on the president's first full day in office. And we took up active observer status in the ICC Assembly of States parties becoming what John Bellinger called a non-party partner of the ICC by supporting all of its active prosecutions, including directly acting to bring Congolese warlord Bosco and Uganda in 2013 and uh, a Ugandan warlord Dominic Ongwen in 2015 to the Hague. Uh, we suspended the Millennium Challenge Grant to Malawi, in part because its government allowed a visit by Sudanese President Omar Bashir while Bashir was under an ICC arrest warrant, despite Malawi being an ICC member. And uh, President Obama spoke out publicly and strongly on an historic day, the day that, uh, that Kenya ratified and put into effect its second constitution, saying that its invitation 
uh, to Bashir and its presence at that event to undermine the commitment to the rule of law which that, uh, uh, which that Constitution was to represent. My extensive travels, however, as U.S. Ambassador at Large between 2009 and 2015, nonetheless faced uh, an abiding question. I heard it uh, from one end of the world to the other. How can you ask other countries to abide by obligations that you won't take on yourself? Now, there's a fair answer to that question, and it was eventually understood by our friends. There's a constitutional requirement of two-thirds Senate vote for treaty ratification, and U.S. history and tradition has been for slow and painful uh, consideration uh, before we uh, enter into binding legal commitments. What we can do is to abide by similar or higher standards than those in these treaties by our own internal adoption and implementation of law and policy. We cannot get more than 62 votes in the Senate to ratify the Disabilities Treaty, but we can enforce the Americans for Disabilities Act, which has tougher requirements than those in the treaty. We can't persuade two-thirds of senators to ratify the Law of the Sea Treaty, despite the support of every U.S. Armed Services Chief, past and present, but will abide by its rules. This does cut us out of treaty body decisions and currently makes it hard to confront China, a state that ratified the Law of the Sea Treaty about its defiance of the recent international judicial decision in validating the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. But in our conduct, we can meet or we can exceed international standards and thus be true to our values. With the ICC, this argument is on even more solid ground. Under the foundational Rome Statute, the primary obligation is on states to investigate or prosecute their own. The ICC cannot become involved unless the state does not undertake a genuine process. It's called complementary, complementary meaning that the international court is a court of last resort, only complementary to the national system. Let me share my own experience in using that argument. Careful. I have to be to avoid internal U.S. government deliberations or anything else secret or confidential and to speak only from what is on the public record or that that was heard from discussions outside government. During my six-year tenure at the State Department, I took the at-large period of the job seriously. On the run because of the law, almost, because of, almost like a fugitive, I used to joke. I covered more than 1.5 million miles in... 1,250 days uh, on the road, 87 countries, but some many times, like 15 times the Democratic Republic of Congo. At numerous stops, I spoke proudly of the U.S. system of military and criminal justice, mentioning Lieutenant Kelly's conviction of the My Lai Massacre, or the convictions of the Blackwater Guards for killing unarmed civilians in Baghdad's in the Seward Square, of Sergeant Bale's life sentence for killing 16 innocent Afghanis. I responded to challenges as to our inconsistency by arguing that we were meeting or exceeding the obligations of ICC members. That, quote, we would never give an ICC prosecutor legitimate cause to take up the case against an American because we would have pursued the case ourselves. Such a declaration came hard up against the policy turning the page as to the criminal responsibility of those who had authorized and committed acts of cruel treatment or torture as so-called enhanced interrogation. The best I could do was to cite the courageous decision of former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder to appoint John Durham as special consul. If you want to see an example of my pitch, you can go to the website of our mission in Geneva and find the transcript of my press conference outside the UN Human Rights Council chamber in January 2010. You can also find the well-informed responses attached to it, uh, that the Durham inquiry uh, constituted a genuine process. Many disagreed. They argued that Durham was only permitted to examine conduct that went beyond the OLC, really the outrageous OLC guidance. He was allowed only to make a preliminary review, and he had nothing like the resources that the U.S. Senate was deploying in its non-criminal investigation. Nonetheless, my colleagues continued, and I hope my successors will always continue, 
to push other governments to hold powerful men to account, to hail and support efforts at the high level, like that of the Guatemalan Attorney General to bring to trial former Chief of State Rio Smont for the genocide of the Ushio Maya, or those at the lower level, like the actions of local prosecutors in the Balkans to prosecute their own people for the crimes against others during the conflicts of the 1990s. And we'll continue to push, and we need to continue to push, because the victims and survivors of the greatest crimes known to humankind across this planet need our leadership to achieve the justice that's their right. And I need to point out that it's important to note that the alleged crimes committed during U.S. enhanced interrogations do not reach anything like the scale of many of these other violations. The Durham Review was looking into 101 cases of alleged abuse, including those of two detainees who died in custody. A broader inquiry could increase these numbers, but even with the widest scope, the numbers of victims pale in comparison to those in the situations that have come before international courts and tribunals. But we know that in politics, nothing quite undermines a prospective leader's support more than the perception of not following rules that you would apply to others. It did matter when the going got tough. In the summer of 2015, when Bashir came to South Africa for an AU summit, and a court order was issued by the High Court of South Africa that he shouldn't leave the country, and the government permitted him to leave in defiance of that order, U.S. officials spoke publicly in criticism of the decision. The response of the South African authorities expressed most frankly and publicly in an ANC declaration said in full effect, we don't need to listen to you. This is more serious than just taking away our argument that we're doing the same, the same uh, outside the ICC that we would do inside. If you read the public testimony of the report of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and related reporting, and you look at the ICC's 124 country membership list, you'll realize that enhanced interrogations were carried out on the territory of multiple ICC member states. At the ICC conference that drafted the statute, the U.S. argued the court could, should not have jurisdiction over the actions of the citizens of non-parties. We lost. The ICC has territorial jurisdiction. Full stop. We need to put that argument aside is wholly unpersuasive to those who would decide the issue. If serious crimes are committed, the winning argument is complementary, that the United States has undertaken a genuine process. That is what those allies who joined us in coalitions of the willing need from us, and particularly those who hosted some of these sites and now are obligated to investigate us if we're not doing it ourselves. It's gone beyond that in the case of Afghanistan, an ICC state party since 2003 where the ICC Office of Prosecutor, the OTP, has had open a preliminary examination, publicly at least, since 2007. If you read the annual public reports filed each November by the OTP, you will see the office has determined that there have been no violations of the Rome Statute committed by U.S. service members or our allies in aerial bombardments. But if you look at the report of November 2014, the focus has become the detentions in U.S. The focus had then become the detentions in U.S. military custody from May 2003, when Afghanistan joined the ICC, until June 2004, when after the Abu Ghraib revelations in Iraq, U.S. commanders prohibited the use of coercive interrogation techniques. If detainees were abused during this period because of a gloves off strategy had been pushed from Washington, the ICC could have a case. However, if you look to the investigative reports publicly released by the U.S. military and our Senate Armed Services Committee, you'll, I think, realize that such a case would not be a strong one. However, in 2014, in December 2014, we had, of course, the, the Senate Select Committee of Intelligence release of its 500-page summary, uh, somewhat redacted, that discussed enhanced interrogation by the intelligence community at detention sites that continued until 2006. Of the violations that it found, a substantial number appear to have been committed at the facility known as Cobalt, or Sandpit, which is publicly known to be located in Afghanistan. The OTP's preliminary examination report in November 2015, after my tenure in the U.S. government, 
shows that it's now focusing on whether the Durham investigation of interrogations at those IC sites constituted a genuine process, focusing on, quote, those most responsible, those for the most serious crimes. Now, as a former U.S. attorney, I'm very proud of the U.S. prosecution system, and I can say that John Durham is one tough prosecutor of official misconduct. He led the case against FBI agent John Connolly for complicity in the crimes of Whitey Bolter here in the Boston area, a prosecution that sent the agent to prison for 40 years. But was his mandate on interrogations broad enough? Did he have access to all of the six million documents that took the Senate committee years to ferret out and allowed it to prepare its yet unreleased 6,700 page report? These questions can only be answered by appointment of a special counsel with the mandate and resources to review all of the now available evidence, classified and unclassified, and to proceed or not proceed based upon an independent decision as to whether there are prosecutable cases against officials at whatever level. Until then, our leadership for human rights and international justice is not just compromised by arguments about our inconsistency. We find ourselves on the other side from our best allies, and the other side from our friends of the ICC, in whom the hopes of so many victims and survivors around the world are signed. At a time when mass atrocities in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere have made more people refugees than ever before in human history, we cannot be making arguments and taking positions that can be used by major perpetrators to escape justice. We need to fulfill our own obligations so that we can more effectively marshal the global support necessary to bring the leaders responsible for these horrible crimes.